From the ashes of a rejected Yoshi pitch rose Croc, a cute little platformer game for the PlayStation. It was okay, the gameplay was relatively fun, but it was held back by some frustrating level design, poor bosses, and some very strange controls. While I had some fun with it, there was a lot I wish they did better, and of course, when dealing with a sequel, doing things better is something you've got the opportunity to do. Croc ended up selling super freaking well. It sold over 3.5 million copies on just PlayStation alone, so they decided to follow up that success with Croc 2. Like the first game, it also had a PC version, but the Saturn version was cancelled in favor of a port to Dreamcast, but they ended up not doing that because, you know, the Dreamcast wasn't doing super well, and they're like, yeah, let's just not bother with that one. There was a lot about the first game that I really wish they did better, so I'm very interested in seeing how they handled this one, how it controls, how the boss fights are, even the level design itself. I'm always interested in seeing how developers evolve and get better at what they do, so it's been a while since I've been this excited and checking out a sequel to something that I've reviewed, so enough said, why don't we... Every time I leave the game in the thing and then I go to record, why do I do this... Dude, this title screen rules. It's a bunch of gobos having a beach party. Like, Croc's not even anywhere in sight. It's just these little critter dudes having a good time. That's adorable. The story begins once again with a real-time cutscene. We see this little engineer gobo building a little airplane in his little workshop. Man, I really like how the previous game's theme song is playing off a radio. That's a really nice touch. He's even humming along to it. That's so cute. <laughs> While walking back home for the night, he stumbles upon a group of Dantinis performing a ritual to resurrect Baron Dante. Finding himself cornered, the Dantinis kidnap the Gabo engineer. The presentation in this cutscene is actually pretty good. Like, just that POV shot of Baron Dante towering over him. Man, that looks awesome. We then cut to Croc hanging out on a beach when a bottle washes ashore. Inside of it, he finds a message from his family explaining that they've lost their son. Croc then sets out to find his parents, enlisting the help of the Gabos along the way. Yeah, I think this is a pretty good follow-up plot, you know? Like, they make good use of Croc's origins as an orphan to create a plot that's a lot more personal to Croc this time, all the while they manage to bring the villain back in a big, fun, and goofy way so he can get in the way of things once again. Yeah, that's good. We then find ourselves landing in a hub world, and yeah, Croc's got hub worlds this time. Every one is a small village of Gobos. The first one's sailor-themed, then there's snow-themed, volcano-themed, and lastly, well, I don't really know what to call the last one, but there's four of them total. Instead of tackling each level in a linear fashion via the world map, you're now free to do them all in whichever order you please. Once you finish all of them, you'll then get to move on to the next village. Oh man, Croc controls so much better this time around. It's no longer that bizarre tank control camera and analog hybrid. Now, it's full analog, baby. Just like Mario, just like Rayman, Spyro, Banjo, exactly as it should be for a 3D platformer. You've got no idea how much easier it is to make jumps going from Croc 1 to Croc 2. Like, before I had to carefully aim myself every time I wanted to make a jump somewhere that wasn't directly in front of me. Now, I just go. The camera controls are kind of weird though. I don't mean it's weird to control, I mean it's just kind of weird what they went with. The camera does a solid job of staying behind you automatically without being too aggressive about it, but you can also swing it around manually with the circle button. Holding it down will glue the camera to your back, much like Croc 1 had. But what's so strange to me is that Croc 1 lets you use the right stick to move the camera, at least while you were staying still, so I kind of figured this game would simply employ something similar to other 3D platformers from the time, but instead, the right stick is completely functionless in this game. It doesn't do anything. It is functional, though. I guess you could think of it maybe as a less snappy version of the L target in a Zelda game or something. It works fine. It's it's just kind of strange that they went with this over the alternative. Croc still got all of his moves from the first game. He's got the tail whip, the ground pound, the sidestep. Everything's all here, though you really don't need the sidestep anymore since the game no longer has tank controls that I kind of find the tail whip has a longer wind-up animation than it used to. It's less quick to the point, though I still find it works all the same. I just think the animation was maybe slowed down a little bit. The actual timing of the attack doesn't feel much different. And we've got a couple of brand new moves as well, the first of which they call the triple jump. I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense to call it that. It's more of a high jump than anything. You execute it by double tapping the X button for a ground pound and then holding it so when Croc lands, he'll bounce up high into the air. I suppose it's 
it's called the triple jump because you're pressing the X button three times total to execute it, but even by then, the phrases double and triple jump were so strongly associated with, you know, double and triple jumping that calling it that was a pretty weird move in my opinion. And secondly, we've got this flip jump, which you can execute by holding down both the shoulder buttons. It's supposed to be for making longer jumps, but I never found much practical use for it. I fared against each gap just fine with a regular jump, so I always felt that if I used this one, I would just end up falling into a pit. Every level now contains a specific objective, so you're not just running to the end and then banging a gong for no reason. Though most levels will still simply involve getting to the end of it, they just make the objective something like, uh, get my sandwich back from the crow or rescue the woolly mammoth, and then they just stick those things at the end of the stage. But even when the objective doesn't actually change much gameplay wise, I still like the feeling of knowing you have a real goal of some sort, you know, instead of just reaching the end of the level for the sake of reaching the end of the level. Sometimes though, you will have an objective that'll require doing some exploration. One of the earliest examples has you finding five treasure chests in this mine here. You get to ride the mine carts to different rooms looking for them all. These levels were kind of hit and miss for me. I really do love having an occasional level that focuses on exploration, and some of these were pretty fun, but sometimes your goal is far too obtuse. The worst one for me was this one here. We have to rescue 30 baby gobos. It's not really that difficult, but the stage took me half an hour just because of how tedious it was. You can't just run into the gobo to rescue it like you could in the first game. Now, you gotta pick it up, walk all the way to a cradle, and plop it in, which is kinda cute, I will admit, but it just really needs to be streamlined. Not to mention, the game's new unforgiving life system made it incredibly stressful. While the first game followed in Sonic's footsteps by having your gems act as a shield, you know, dropping them all when you get hit, this time you've got a more traditional hit point system, no lives necessary. You've got three hearts, if you get hit, you lose a heart, if you run out of hearts, you get a game over. Falling into pits or spikes now respawns you with one point taken away. Sounds good, right? Sounds perfectly reasonable. The problem with this new system is how unforgiving they made it. Finding hearts to replenish your health is incredibly rare. Oftentimes you'll enter a stage and whatever you've got is what you'll have to work with. That means if you enter a level with two health, that means you can only make two mistakes, whether that's getting hit by an enemy, a projectile, falling in a pit, anything. Make a third mistake and you're doing the whole level all over. There are no checkpoints for dying. The checkpoints for falling in a pit, but you only get the checkpoint if you still have hit points remaining. You've got no idea how stressful it was to find all 30 baby gobos, knowing that one single hit would make me lose 20 minutes of progress, all because the developers just had to be stingy with health. You can increase your maximum health with health pots, but even then the game doesn't give you all your health back whenever you beat a level. If you have one heart left when you finish a stage, you're going to the next level with one heart left. And if you die and continue, it only starts you back with three health. It doesn't matter if your maximum is nine, you're only getting three. And the hearts you'll need to replenish that further will still be incredibly rare. Uh, let me put it this way, uh, you ever die in Mario 64 and you're thrown out of the level and you see your health go all the way back up, so you're refreshed, you're replenished, you're ready to give it another shot. Imagine if they only filled it up this much. And you know how you collect coins to restore your health, right? Imagine if they only put like one or two coins hidden away really well in the level. That would make it really hard to get your health back. And that would make things pretty stressful, wouldn't it? Croc 2 is not a difficult game, but it is a very punishing game. Doing something that is not hard gets a lot harder when there's absolutely no room for error. I mean, like, some levels will require tight jumps that will take a number of tries, and you simply don't have enough tries. I shouldn't have to lose 20 minutes of progress because I failed a jump twice. That's just absurd. Now, maybe this is just me, but personally, I prefer games that are challenging, but checkpoint you often. Meat Boy and Celeste are both very good modern examples of this. You might die in one hit, yeah, but 
you'll never lose more than 30 seconds of progress. Mario games do this well too, honestly, since the levels aren't going to be long enough to make dying take away much more than 3 or 4 minutes of progress, usually at least. There needs to be room for human error. Having the constant fear of losing a ton of progress because of very few mistakes, well, that's just stressful and very discouraging. This is easily my biggest criticism of this game. It can call for some majorly frustrating moments every now and then, but unlike the first game, this is actually one of my very few major criticisms. This game does a lot of things way better than before, so why don't we dive into the improvements? First off, the presentation is once again pretty dang good. Croc's model doesn't look a whole lot different from before, but we've again got some bright and colorful environments that are just a joy to look at. The Gobbos have also seen a slight redesign, and I think they look much better. Before, the texture on them looked kinda yucky, like they looked like pine cones or something. It was just a rougher texture that really didn't make me feel as if they were fuzzy creatures. They looked more like prickly creatures, but here, they're way more fluffy looking, and they all wear different costumes too. Every village will have the Gombo sporting different wardrobe. It looks like these little guys are ready for some fun in the snow. Look at them throwing snowballs at me. That's awesome. And this guy right here jumping on this trampoline. Another word of his dialogue appears every time he comes down. That is just great, dude. There's so many details like this in the world that had me actively exploring every hub trying to track down anything quirky and fun. From the side quest that has you building a snowman to their undying love for ginger soda, it's just too adorable, man. One detail I noticed that I particularly liked is how Croc speaks in the exact same primitive way that the Gobbos do, which makes a lot of sense because he was raised by Gobbos. I thought that was really cool. There's a lot of stupid fun writing in this game. I'm Roger Red Ant, and I'm gonna to blow you to smithereens. Yeah, dude, just freaking announce your full name and the crime you're gonna commit. I'm Wallace Stinkleberg, and I'm gonna rob this bank. Shouldn't have done that. The gameplay has been vastly improved as well. Aside from controlling much better, the level design feels much more organic. Instead of being a lot of room by room ventures with copy and pasted platforms, the levels feel much more natural. A wider variety of landmarks like rocks and bridges and trees to jump on, and we've got winding pathways that connect each platforming section. The level design has seen a massive upgrade. When you jump on a crumbling platform, for example, there's now this sense of urgency because it's gonna fall apart a lot lot faster than it was going to in Croc 1, and now that you've got controls to deal with something like that, this actually poses somewhat of a challenge. I mean, like, you can slap a 5 or 6 second time limit on how long you can stay on a platform, but having it crumble right away is a whole another thing. And the boss fights, man, these have been improved so freaking much. You're no longer just slapped in a freaking arena with them where you'll uh, clunkily hit them with your tail until they're done -zo. Now, the boss fights all incorporate either some sort of platforming or light elements of puzzle. Well, I don't know if that's really considered puzzle, but I just don't really know what else to call something that involves interacting with your environment to defeat a boss instead of just attacking it itself. You guys know what I mean, at least. Maybe we as reviewers kind of got to get out of the habit of just referring to anything where you interact with your environment instead of the character itself puzzle. But, like, for now, I just don't really know what else to call that. I really like this squid boss fight. It's one of the first ones you fight in the game. You gotta carry these TNT boxes across the water by hopping across these platforms. And when you're in position, you chuck it at them, watch it blow up, and then you gotta swim back. I like that the challenge is only getting it there, and you gotta simply swim back to shore. Oh, actually, that's another thing that's much better in this game, is the swimming controls. Uh, the underwater segments were omitted entirely in favor of simply swimming at the surface. It's much less interesting, yeah, but at least it means you won't have to battle with those terrible swimming controls anymore. And brand new to the series, we've got some vehicle stages. Uh-oh, based on my experience, this usually means bad news. The first one's a boat race. There's really not much to it. You just kind of go. There's like no boosting or items or any mechanical depth to it at all. As long as you don't crash too much, you'll win just fine. It's okay, I guess. It wasn't particularly entertaining to me, but hey, it was easy and I was able to move on from it pretty quickly, so whatever. We've also got a hang glider stage that's on rails. You just kind of guide Croc through the rings and around the obstacles. Again, 
again, it's not that great, but at least it's easy and short. The final one's a kart race, which is actually pretty interesting because that rejected Yoshi pitch that Croc started out as was actually a kart racing game, so I feel like this might have been a leftover idea from before. But once again, it's not really that great, not really that difficult, it's just kind of there. Honestly, I'm kind of relieved, you know, like vehicle segments usually drive me up the wall on platformers, but I didn't find these ones to be that bad. But even still, I really don't think they needed to be here. Like, they're so simple and forgettable that they really don't add much to the overall experience. I noticed there's a much smaller variety in enemy types this time. The first Croc game had tons, but there's not very many here. Nine times out of ten, you're just gonna be fighting these exact same Dantini dudes. It's a minor complaint since I feel the game makes up for it greatly with a much better game design, but I did find myself kind of missing seeing all the different types of little critters everywhere. Once again, you'll find yourself collecting gems. This time, it's diamonds instead of crystals, and instead of being for withstanding attacks and earning extra lives, diamonds are now a currency you'll get to use at a shop. I love how the gobbles give you this little debit card to use. I don't know how that translates. Like, maybe you, maybe you cash them into a bank, like off screen, or I don't know, I'm <laughs> putting too much thought into this. Every village has this bobcat looking dude named Swap Me Pete, who's got a variety of items for sale. Swap Me Pete and Odd Guy. This is the best place you can get heart pots, but there's also some stuff you'll need to get all of the collectibles if you'd like to 100% the game. One of the items is a remote controlled gobble robot that you can use on these specially marked platforms. It'll spawn it in an area and you'll guide it along a pathway, usually hiding collectibles at the end. It'll run out of juice after a short time, so you really gotta cut as many corners as you can to to get to the end. Also available at the store are three types of lifesaver gummies. What, like the candy? God, I remember I used to get those for Christmas every year when I was a kid. Apparently Fox, the game's publisher, Fox published games? Apparently they did, I had no idea. Anyway, apparently they had a deal with Lifesavers where they advertised it in-game. Weird how product placement was a thing back then, I'm sure a lot of you probably remember Crazy Taxi, though they actually made it work really well in that game. Like, it made sense in the context of Crazy Taxi that somebody wants you to drive them to Pizza Hut, right? I always thought Pikmin 2 made the best use of product placement. It was like you were discovering a lost civilization, like the human race is extinct at this point, and you're just finding remains of them, and I think using real-world brand the player could actually recognize made that feeling that much stronger. Here though, you just kind of put them on the ground and bounce off of them. It definitely doesn't make me want to go out and buy a pack of lifesavers like Pikmin made me want to go eat Vlasic pickles, that's for sure. And, and yeah, when I was 10 years old, I actually begged my mom to buy some Vlasic pickles because I saw them in Pikmin 2, and those pickles are really good, so thank you, product placement. You can place them down on specially marked spots to gain access to higher areas. Just like the RC Gobbo, these will sometimes hide hidden collectibles. Emphasis on sometimes. It's pretty irritating that I bust my ass off to make sure I have enough money for these things, so I always have enough of these things, so I can always use one whenever I see a spot that I need to use it, but sometimes the area it hides only has a heart or some gems. It always makes me feel like I got ripped off and I wasted the item. I really think they should have hidden the hearts in areas that you didn't have to pay for something to get to and instead save these areas just for the collectibles. If you're lucky though, these areas will hide one of the five specially colored diamonds, which make a return from Croc 1. If you get all five, you'll gain access to a room where you can do a platforming challenge to get a golden gobbo statue. Don't screw these up, you only get the one shot. If you blow it, it, you'll have to start the whole level over and recollect everything. If you get all the statues in the village, you can then open up the bonus level that'll reward you with a jigsaw piece, again just like Croc 1. This time, there's only four bonus levels instead of eight, which makes it a little less strenuous to 100% the game, which I did quite like. Getting all the jigsaw pieces will once again unlock the secret world, but uh, this time I was not able to get there. I don't know what happened, but my game totally glitched out on me. I got all the statues in the second village, yet the counter only read four instead of five, and I double checked and I did in fact have all five statues collected. All five stages were in fact marked. Yet as far as the game was concerned, I only had four of them, and you're not able to recollect them once you get one because those specially colored diamonds vanish from the level once you get the golden statue. So the 
door to this bonus level was permanently shut. I searched online to see if anybody else had the same issue, and I did end up finding somebody who experienced something very similar to me. Perhaps it's because my disc is pretty scratched up? Some of the cutscenes wouldn't load either because of it, so apologies, but I wasn't able to check out the secret levels this time. I did at least really enjoy the conclusion to the core game, though. The final fight with Baron Dante was actually pretty good this time. You're not just thrown into an arena where you clunkily smack him around with your tail. Instead, you've got to work with the Gabo engineer that you saw in the beginning cutscene. Our fuzzy little friend here is going to try to place these five magic crystals around the stage and attempt to open a portal to seal Dante away, so the fight doesn't really consist of fighting as much as it consists of surviving. You'll have to knock out any Dantinis that Dante will summon to take away the Gabo engineer, and you'll fight torrents of wind and dodge uh, fireballs and stuff. It felt more like an obstacle course than it did a fight. It was really fun, like it was pretty solid. I think this was a really good way to execute a boss in a genre that, you know, lends itself more so to uh, tackling obstacles than it does like fighting and combat. And the ending's real nice too. Croc reunites with his family and all the gobbos you met across the game come to celebrate. There's a cliffhanger where Baron Dante steals your family's crocodile eggs and I guess the secret world would have you getting those back for like a secret ending or something, but again, I wasn't able to play that part, so as far as I'm concerned, this is the ending that I'm gonna have to settle with. And credit. Jesus Christ, guys, you don't gotta go so fast. Slow down, dude. Overall, it's still just like an alright game, but it's substantially better than the first one. And the attention to detail. There's so many fun and adorable little things that had a smile on my face time and time again. It can be pretty freaking frustrating here and there because of the stupid hit point system, but despite that, I still had a pretty alright time with Croc 2. Interestingly enough, despite being a vastly better game than the first one, it reviewed considerably worse. I guess I would probably attribute that to the standards at the time. By 1999, we already had games like Spyro and Banjo, and Rayman 2 was just months away. It may have managed to be better than the original, but I guess it still kind of paled in comparison to what else was available at the time. If you ever wanted to check the series out, I wouldn't bother playing the first, just play the second one. On top of being a better game in every single way, it's also a bit longer. There's there's definitely more content here as well. There was actually going to be a third Croc game for PS2, Xbox, and GameCube, but it ended up getting cancelled shortly after Argonaut's closure in 2004, which is a shame. Seeing how much they improved between titles already, I would have loved to see how they fared against the next generation of consoles. Like I said in the previous video, sometimes you just gotta take a step back and think about what could have been. But uh, yeah, I guess that wraps up the Croc series. Um, well, not quite. There were two Croc games in the Game Boy Color, uh, both of which came out after Croc 2, but I don't own either of them, so perhaps another time. For now, why don't we finish that stack of PlayStation games? So, I'll see you guys next time with... What is that, a Kuji the Heartless? I don't know what that is. Let's find out. Uh, hello, welcome to the end slate. Uh, if you want to check out another platforming game I've done before, you can click the link right here. And if you maybe want to support the show and help me continue doing it as a full-time job, you can donate as little as a dollar a month to my Patreon and get access to the Nitrad podcast and some blooper reels and stuff. So, uh, yeah, love you guys and see you again soon.